Please tell me. Yay, we are live. Thank you all. It's 11.05. Thank you all so much for your patience. Um, we had to pivot here quickly for, <laughs> for our webinar today. So you don't see our fancy schmancy uh, Stanley Law backgrounds or anything. We had all of this wonderful stuff prepared and you don't see any of that because we had to change something last minute, technology. Sometimes it can be our best friend, sometimes our worst enemy. I am Angela Moonen, and we are here with Social Security Disability Attorney Shannon Doan. Welcome, Shannon. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, on behalf of Stanley Law Offices, we have we welcome you, um, and we welcome your uh questions about social security disability. And we are talking today, as you see from our, our slides here, the differences between SSDI and SSI and why that matters for you, why it's relevant, when it's relevant, and where you may fit into the scheme of things. If you're not aware, yes, pers personal injury uh, law firm uh, is personal injury is the predominantly what we do, but we have a dedicated social security disability team who is on fire and is, is doing amazing things on behalf of people all over the country. So whereas our personal injury and our workers' compensation teams uh, are devoted to the markets that we serve in Syracuse and Watertown and uh, Binghamton, Rochester, Montrose, Pennsylvania, and in Oneonta as well, as well as those surrounding areas. We with Social Security Disability, Shannon and her team are amazing, number one. And they can, number two, they can help you no matter where you live um, 50, 50, in the 50 states. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to you, Shannon, and I'm going to walk uh, our audience through our slides. This is being recorded. So if you can't watch, um, this is going to be shorter than our typical webinars today, although we're getting a little bit of a late start. Um, but if you don't have the opportunity to watch the entire webinar or you have a friend or family member that you feel um, could benefit from some of this insight and information. You can go to our website. This is being recorded. You can reference back on this on Facebook. They're archived typically for 30 days. We'll also be on our YouTube channel uploaded. Might take us a day or so to get it up there, but um, you can, you'll can you be able to find it on our website as well under resources and webinars. So with that, Shannon, walk us through, um, if you if you will, the differences between SSDI and SSI and why it matters to know the difference. What we're talking about today are the differences between SSDI and SSI, um, and we're focusing on adults, so 18 and older, um, and how these different types of benefits um, can be available to, to adults. Um, first, SSDI stands for Social Security Disability Insurance Benefits, whereas SSI is Supplemental Security Income. Um, let's first talk about the similarities. The medical requirements are the same for both. Um, so to, to be eligible, you have to be found medically disabled. Those requirements are the same. What is different are the technical requirements the first prong that you have to meet before Social Security will consider if you're medically eligible. Um, before we get to the next, the next piece of information we're going to talk about, um, it's important to note some people may be eligible for SSDI only, some may be eligible for SSI only, some people may be eligible for both SSDI and SSI, um, and unfortunately, there's a small segment of people who may not be eligible for either SSDI or SSI, um, either because of the technical requirements or the medical requirements. Um, so what we're going to talk about next um, is how these programs are different. The first difference is one is an entitlement-based program. The other one is a means-tested program. Um, those aren't very user-friendly words, so we're going to No, I know. I'm sitting here going, means-tested. Yeah. 
Um, that's it's not plain language. So what we're going to do is break it down into more digestible forms. Um, SSDI is an entitlement program. What that means is our technical eligibility for SSI is based on our earnings records. Those FICA taxes that we see being cut out of our paycheck every week that we're working. Um, right. The FICA taxes being cut out results in quarters of coverage or work credits. I like work credits because it's, it's a little easier to say. Um, <laughs> whatever your age, you must have earned enough work credits within a certain period of time um, to be insured for benefits. It, it's kind of like paying your car insurance in advance. Um, the more you the work, the longer you're going to be insured for those benefits. Um, so in a sense, Shannon, because we've done some workers' mm -hmm. compensation mm -hmm. webinars in the past also, and, and I might ask you about how those two can at times integrate, mm -hmm. right? Um, but with sometimes, you know, sometimes people think it's best to work under the table because of, you know, trying to just earn cash and uh, certain service industries probably make that more. But if, if longer term, it can also work against you because that work wasn't credited to you in the, in the sense of these work credits, right? Absolutely. Um, working under the table, can create huge problems when it comes to SSDI eligibility. Um, because again, our eligibility for SSDI is based on those FICA contributions that are cut out of our paychecks. Um, and, it, and it's very difficult to have a conversation with the client who I know has worked consistently all their life, but unfortunately did so for cash or under the table and wasn't paying in um, and now that unfortunately due to, to unexpected circumstances with their health, they're now seeking SSDI, but unfortunately aren't covered because they don't have those mm. work credits. Wow. Okay. Um, generally the rule of thumb um, and the number, the specific numbers of quarters of coverage or work credits varies based on our age. Um, but generally you have to have worked five out of the last 10 years. Um, to qualify. Um, people under age 24 may not need to have worked as long, um, but again, there still is that, that insured status requirement. Now, okay. let's pivot to SSI. What does means tested mean? SSI, um, to put it very bluntly or clearly, um, is based on financial need. Um, adults, well, again, we're focusing on adults, but children may also be eligible for SSI disability benefits. And we'll cover that in a future webinar. Um, but okay. for adults, they may be eligible for SSI disability if they have little or no income, little or no resources, and have a disability. Um, so it has nothing to do with our work history. Um, so if you've never worked and never achieved those quarters of coverage or work credits, you still may be eligible for SSI based on what your household income and resource situation looks like. Um, I oh, always, by the way, Amanda, I just or uh, Shannon, I wanted to let you know because I just wrote about your paralegal, Amanda. Also, Lori he is here, and she just commented that Shannon is great. She helped me get my disability. <laughs> so Hi, I just Lori. As you comments and stuff. Or, and, and by the way, to any of our viewers, uh, please ask any questions that you might have as Shannon's going through this. This is really helpful information. And, and you've got free legal counsel here, essentially, for the next 30 minutes. So ask away. OK, great, Shannon. I just wanted to share with you that Lori made that nice comment. <laughs> so when it, when it comes to SSI, I encourage everyone to to see if they're eligible um, because you, you aren't going to know if you're under those income and resource limits until you apply, until Social Security looks at your, your particular situation and makes a determination. Um, and again, I would rather apply and be told, no, we're not eligible than to not apply and potentially miss out on a benefit to which we could be entitled. Um, the next difference, and we've kind of touched on it before, is our insured status. Um, and again, to, to put it very, very simply, 
we have to have worked long enough to be insured for SSDI. Um, look at it sort of an analogy that I like to use is, is our car insurance. If we've paid our premiums and are involved in an accident, we're going to be insured to be covered for that accident. SSDI is essentially the same way. By working, we are achieving an insured status. So if a disability arises, we're covered. Um, that's that's about now. The I do have a question be. here, uh, um, Shannon, about what if you're self-employed and you're pay you're paying, but it's a different. That's a different. Is that a different deal at all? If you're self-employed, as long as you are paying taxes, it's not under the table or for cash. Self-employment, you can still qualify for SSDI okay. because you're you're okay. paying those taxes. Excellent question. Yeah. Okay. Um, and to to again contrast it with SSI, there are no insured status requirements. So even if you have never worked, never, never paid in. And, You've been a stay at home mom or a stay at home dad, or correct. you had some kind of disability growing up through your life or whatever prevented you from working. You are just by the mere fact that you're here and that you have a financial need and you can't work. You get, you can get SSI. Correct. Correct. And again, okay. I would rather explore the possibilities and be told no and be told than no. to not explore yep. them. Exactly. Yep. Okay. Um, the next difference is it goes back to our income and resource limits. With SSI, again, since it is a need-based program, you're going to be subject to very many income and resource limits. Contrast that to SSDI. Monthly benefits are not subject to household income and resource limits. So for example, um, you're married and your spouse works and makes $150,000 a year. You own a house, you have two cars, you have savings, you have retirement. Those types of things are not going to be counted against you for SSDI technical eligibility. Whereas gotcha. things like that are likely going to mean you're not eligible for SSI. Um, but right. Those SSI, are all factored in right, correct. into so some for, kind of formula, essentially. Correct. Right. So for um, SSDI. And then in terms of the, oh, go yeah, ahead. Go ahead. I was just going Again. to say the, the SSDI, um, the workers' compensation, because you put it in here, receipt of workers' comp. Can we, at some point, you make your own determination when, Shannon, but if we can talk about, well, what is that? Mm -hmm. Why is that? Why, why, if I'm getting workers' comp, am I suddenly not as eligible for my Social Security because I paid into the system regardless, right? Excellent question. Um, what happens when someone is on workers' compensation benefits and are also found disabled for SSDI, there is the potential for what is called a workers' compensation offset. And what that means is if the amount of your, your Social Security disability insurance benefits is in this pile and your workers' compensation benefits are in the, this pile, if you add both of those together, and the monthly benefit total exceeds 80% of what your average earnings were, Social Security is going to offset your monthly worker or monthly SSDI benefits um, based on the fact that you're over that 80%. Um, as your workers' compensation benefits go down, that is important information to report to Social Security so that they can recalculate your monthly SSDI benefits. Um, it also and so you, and because we've got a workers comp team as part of Stanley Law, mm -hmm. you work with, I've heard the workers comp team reference it in some of the weekly meetings and things mm -hmm. that we have. Shannon, you and your paralegal, Amanda, you you work uh, uh, frequently to, to, to integrate that process for folks, correct? correct? Um, and I have to say our workers comp team is excellent. Um, they're very <clears throat> well versed in how Social Security and workers comp benefits affect each other. Um, and they're mm. very, very 
keen and aware of how to structure workers' compensation settlements um, to do their very best to minimize the long-term impact. The impact, in right, right. In terms Makes of sense. an offset. Um, and, right. and that's one of the advantages, I think, of having both of their teams under the same roof. Mm -hmm. We can work together and we do work together. Um, we, we work together all the time to make sure that the left hand and the right hand of SSDI and workers' comp know what each other's doing. Right. So excellent. Right. Point. Okay. Um, the next difference um, in the two is the waiting period. Um, with SSDI, there is a five month waiting period from the established disability onset date before monthly benefits are paid. Um, now, so, why is it, it seems like kind of a random number, Shannon, like why five? I, I don't quite know what the explanation is for the five um, particularly, but the explanation for the waiting period um, is it they feel that it's a, a period of time that is helpful in, in making sure that that person is not going to be returning back to work. Um, I see. It's the, we found you disabled and, and let's, let's see if, if you're going to be remaining out of work or if you're going to be returning back to work. Um, and, and is there, are the, are the benefits retro once they do? And that's begin? where we're going to get to that one too. So that's, yeah. yep. That's okay. one of the other differences. Okay. <laughs> So how this waiting period works for SSDI, if you are found disabled January 15th, you have to wait five months before benefits are actually paid out. So typically how this would work is you would have a waiting period of February, March, April, May, June meaning benefits would then start being paid for the month of July. Mm -hmm. Whereas with SSI, there is not a waiting period. Um, again, I think part of that is since SSI is a needs-based program, um, the, the waiting period is not there, meaning that same person being found disabled as of January the 15th, benefits would start on February 1st, the first full month thereafter. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now, the next difference, um, and and you, you kind of alluded to it, um, it was another important difference, and that is in terms of our retroactivity of benefits. Again, not the most user-friendly of terms. Um, so common sense words is it's, how much back pay are you you potentially looking at? Um, and again, there's a huge difference between the two. With SSDI, someone may receive up to 12 months of retroactive benefits or back pay before the application was received. So if you file your application in January of 2024, and you're alleging disability going back to January of 2022, you, if you're found disabled, will get that full 15, 12 months of back due benefits. This is one of the reasons why um, it's important to file in a timely manner. Um, because if you wait three, four, five years after you've stopped working, you're potentially losing out on a lot of back due benefits because again, right. it's capped at that 12 months limit. Um, contrast that with SSI. With SSI, there will be no back pay for benefits prior to the time you filed your application. Again, this I think emphasizes the point it's important to file in a timely manner because the longer you wait, you're potentially losing out on money that, that could be paid to you. Yeah, you so, can never recover that under SSI and you can only recover correct. up to a year's worth with SSDI. Correct. Now, Shannon, and I think that this begs the question too of 
um, how, why do people come to you? Why do people come to Stanley Law to a, a, an SSDI attorney versus trying to go it on their own? One reason I think is it's nice to not go it alone. Um, it is a very long, arduous, arduous and, and often complicated process that involves a lot of paperwork, very, very strict deadlines. And by strict deadlines, I mean you only have a certain amount of time to file an appeal if you're denied. If and most of them do get denied, right? Almost out of the gate, correct. most of them are denied regardless. Correct. People think, oh, I've worked all my life, so I should just be able to fill something out and get my benefits. It's not at all that simple. It, it is not that simple and straightforward. And if you miss filing a, an appeal in a timely manner, unfortunately, more often than not, you have to start the process all over again. Um, which speaks which, to this point, which is just more loss, more loss, and no income coming in during that. Correct. Yeah. And what is an already long process, why add even more months to it? Um, and yeah. to kind of follow up on, on the point you made about the denial rates, um, the last year that I have statistics in terms of what Social Security approves and denies at each level, um, at the initial level, which is the very first level after the application is filed, um, the last year of statistics that I have is, is for 22. Um, Social Security's numbers indicate they approved about 38% of people initially, um, meaning over 60% of people were denied. Um, at the second level, which is called the reconsideration level, Social Security's numbers indicate that they only approved about 15, 1-5% of people at the second level, meaning they denied about 85% of people. Um, at the wow. hearing level, success rates are, are typically higher. Um, at the hearing level, about one in two people were successful or are generally successful. Um, so yes, unfortunately, at the first two levels, especially, um, Social Security typically denies a lot more cases than than they approve. And you um, can't get to that third level where it's one and two because if you can't get through over correct. the first two hurdles, right? Correct. So, so a, another advantage of having representation is, as you can see from our conversation today, a lot of the language isn't always very user friendly. Um, it's not very direct or straightforward, um, and it helps to have someone interpret it for you and break it well, down. You've been on the other side of you've been on the other side of this too, Shannon. Right? Correct. You want to frame Correct. that a little bit because we really just kind of said here she is. At, you want to just give a quick thumbnail of your expertise and the years of experience you you are bringing to to bear. Correct. Um, to put it bluntly, I, I kind of know how the sausage is made. Um, I have almost 19 years of experience working as an attorney for Social Security. I spent about 12 and a half years in a Social Security hearing office as an attorney and as a senior attorney, um, meaning I was working with judges on a daily basis, doing things like drafting their decisions for them, reviewing files and making recommendations about cases that had enough evidence to be approved for benefits. I'm in researching special or complicated issues. Um, I served as a nationwide trainer for other for brand new attorney advisors. Um, I served as a nationwide trainer for senior attorneys and for special details that the, the commissioner of Social Security um, established to help with the backlog. Um, I also spent about four and a half years in the Kansas City Regional Office where I worked quality review. I was a quality review specialist, um, which was essentially a policy with the regional executive team and the regional chief judge. Um, my last two and a half years, I worked in Social Security headquarters um, and was a member of the chief judge's staff um, as one of three attorneys on his policy compliance team. Um, so with that, um, 
I, every and then day. just recently nominated, what were you just recently nominated um, for? Shannon? Recently invited by the National Trial Lawyers Association um, to become a member of their organization um, as being recognized as in the top 15 disability lawyers in the state of New York. Um, so I, I think... A, I, I attribute that success largely to the great team that surrounds me at Stanley Law. I would be remiss not to, to give my paralegal, Amanda, a huge amount of credit um, because I couldn't star. do this without her. She's a rock yeah. star. Um, I also could not do this without the support of Mr. Stanley, um, without the support of, of Taylor, our office manager, who makes sure we all run smoothly. Um, and, Another and, your efforts, <laughs> and, and your efforts in getting our information and making us accessible to people near and far. Um, and again, also the 19 years of experience on the other side of the process, I think helps. Um, we can oh, anticipate sure. things that Social Security may need or want before they have to ask us for it. And we can be very proactive um, and hopefully get pace, cases paid long before that hearing level. Well, and the proactivity too, and we've seen this in some of the reviews that clients leave. And, and, and I want to clarify, this isn't just a, it's not a, it is a little bit of a cheerleading session for Shannon and Amanda because they just work so hard. And, and you see it in the reviews that people leave for y'all. But also, it's really just a testament to understand that when you have this particular team in your corner, um, and you'll see it through the reviews of why the diligence, why the background and experience and expertise on both sides of the table, how it's so valuable in getting better outcomes. And um, I see it day in and day out that what what clients are saying about their experience of how they're feeling kept in the loop and and take get this language broken down for them so that it's easier to understand and digest to be able to get quick responses from you and Amanda to know where they're at there's a lot of comfort and peace of mind in that you know there's no one likes uncertainty there's already enough uncertainty involved in the whole process you guys try to remove or mitigate as much of that mm -hmm. as you possibly can and I, and I think it matters hugely, hugely. I, um, I agree. Social security is absolutely a team sport. Um, it We can't be effective in our work without communication from our clients. Our clients can't be successful in their cases without communication from us. Um, and we mm. are, we're very hands-on. It's, I don't want anyone to feel like they are just in this abyss and not having any idea where they're at in the process. Um, right. Because this things, processes, these processes can take some time. It, I, it can it, take a couple of years from start to finish. And the last thing that we want people to do is feel like they're forgotten about in the process. Um, Mr. But Stanley, I also see based on your reviews, Shannon, mm -hmm. you have a lot of them where people are responding and saying, yeah, I mean, I started working with them and we went through the appeal and we had the hearing and it's done. And it's it, so some of them can also go quite quickly and, and expeditiously. Correct. Correct. Um, and that brings up, I think, a good point as well. Um, there are some particular medical conditions that because of how serious they are, this process can move incredibly quickly. Um, some examples of those conditions would be ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, stage four breast cancer. Um, one of the other conditions that, that I can think of with one of our clients is um, he had a, an artificial heart. Um, there's a, a category of conditions called compassionate allowances. And what that does essentially is fast tracks a disability claim. Um, and that's one of the things that we try to identify when we do our, our new client appointment is, is this a potential compassionate allowance case? Because we then submit a request to Social Security um, we've had clients approved in under a month based on that compassionate allowance provision. 
Um, so if that I, it's the only area, it's the only area of law, and I'm sure there are others, but it's the only area of law that you hear reference of around compassion. <laughs> really? I mean, you don't yes. really hear about that in a lot of other circumstances. Yes. And so we, we want to be sure if, if we can identify a compassionate allowance request, as soon as we know an application is filed, we're submitting that request. Um, so if, if that is a concern that someone has is how long it will take, reach out and talk to us. We, we can give you an idea of, you know, does your case qualify as a compassionate allowance? There's very, there's a very specific list. Um, but those cases do move very, very quickly, um, intentionally. Yeah. All right. So thank you so much for kind of going down those paths. I know we didn't have a specific slide around it, but I thought it was important to emphasize, you know, what um, your background is and then how that impacts. And, and also, what is the experience like for people who try to go it alone? Because it so often than not cannot go the way you need it to go. And then you're that much longer in the process trying to get it. And well, before we wrap um, Shannon, I want you to be able to get through the rest of your slides here. But before we wrap, let's remember to touch on how Stanley Law is compensated um, okay. as part of this process with respect to the, the benefits that are awarded to the okay. client, et cetera. Okay, so the dependent and auxiliary benefits. Again, this is another one of those situations where the language is not very user friendly. Um, what an auxiliary benefit is is can your family members receive payments based on the fact that you have been approved for social security disability ssdi um, in those claims family members such as your spouse or your children may be entitled to additional monthly benefits based on your account um, those benefits are subject to what is called a fact family maximum amount. But again, if you are approved for SSDI, your family members may be eligible for benefits as well. Um, unfortunately, with SSI, payments are not made to anyone other than the disabled individual. So spouses, children, family members um, are not eligible for additional benefits monthly benefits with SSI claims. So that's another, um, I think, huge difference. Sure. Um, the last difference that I'd like to talk about is Medicare versus Medicaid eligibility. If you're approved for SSDI, you become eligible for Medicare um, after a designated time frame following the five month waiting period. Um, that time frame is 24 months. So generally what we're looking at is 29 months from the day you're found disabled, Medicare eligibility will begin. If you are approved for SSI, you may be eligible for Medicaid benefits, um, but it is not as certain and definite as the Medicare eligibility for SSI recipients. Um, and those are, are generally the, the highlight reel, if you will, of the differences in those two benefits. Okay. And I'm going to just to share with viewers, whether you're watching this live, and we actually have had some, some nice engagement here, Shannon. I think it's because, you know, maybe unlike personal injury, SSDI, SSI, it impacts potentially, you know, m m many more people, right? Yes. Um, but uh, so whether you're watching this live or whether you watch this on replay, I think what we'll also do is take Shannon's slides. They're so helpful with your permission, Shannon. We'll, Absolutely. we'll put those into a blog post along with a link to this webinar again. So you can very easily share that blog post link with a, a family member or a friend or go back and reference it. I sometimes, I don't know if you do this, Shannon, but sometimes I'll send a URL to myself I <laughs> so that I have it in the future and I could just search it in my email or in my yes. text to look for it to find yep. it quickly again as a reference. Great minds think alike. Yeah. So before we wrap, we, we said, look, let's talk about, okay, so how are you compensated? And then also talk about, all right, well, so, you know, what if somebody is in, uh, 
Colorado? What if someone is, you know, in Maine or whatever? How, how do you help them and what does the process look like? So how are you compensated and what does that process look like, Shannon? Okay. In terms of how we're compensated, um, we've had people call and say, I, I really need help, but I, I can't afford it right now. That should never be a concern when it comes to what we're doing for you. Um, Social Security is a contingent fee basis. Um, and in common sense terms, that means we don't get paid unless we win your case. Um, more importantly, with Social Security, we don't get paid unless we win your case and there are back due benefits. So, uh, for example, I, I talked with a client this morning. Um, his case was approved at the very first level. Um, and because it was approved so quickly, there were no back due benefits. Um, and in that case, even though we won his case, we do not ask for a fee. What we do is submit a waiver to Social Security indicating that we are not charging and collecting a fee. Um, for people who are successful and have back due benefits, the way that the Social Security fee structure works is the fee is capped at and again, the language is a little off, so I'll explain it. Um, the lesser amount of 25% of the back due benefits, or right now the statutory maximum is $7,200. And Social Security can adjust that amount from time to time. How that works in real life, um, and we're going to do nice whole numbers because math is not my best subject. Um, someone who receives $10,000 in back due benefits, the most the fee could be in that case is $2,500 because it's the smaller amount of the two. Now, let's compare that to someone who has received an $80,000 amount of back due benefits. 25% of that would be $20,000. That's not what our fee is going to be. The most that it could be is that $7,200, which right now is the statutory maximum. I believe that's supposed to go up to, I think, $9,200 later in the year. And but that's a federal thing, so it doesn't vary by state or anything like correct, that. Correct. Correct. Social Security policy caps the contingent fee at that 25%, lesser of 25% or whatever the statutory maximum is. If a fee agreement um, does not contain that language, Social Security will not approve the fee agreement. And at that point, the representative has to submit a fee petition for Social Security to review and approve a fee. Um, we, a representative for Social Security cannot collect a fee that is not approved by Social Security. So everything is, every I is dotted, every T is crossed, Correct. and it all must go through the system. Correct. Correct. And that 25%, $7,200 statutory maximum amount, that's going to be standard for representatives near and far. It, it's not going to change based on the geographical location. Um, all right. Now talk about the process and what it looks like working with you and, and um, your team when someone retains you. State lines or geographic boundaries no longer limit the world of Social Security. Um, thanks to, to, to many different technology platforms, um, Social Security can be an entirely electronic or virtual process at this point. Um, Mr. Stanley has been gracious enough to allow me to work remotely. Um, so everything that we do can be done by phone calls, by Zoom meetings, by MS Teams, by email, by text. All documents can be submitted electronically to Social Security. So really there are no limits in terms of the area we can serve. We're accessible and, and I think our Social Security reviews particularly speak You're your reviews How speak accessible we are. about your accessibility, yes. <laughs> you know, we can text, we can email, we can phone call. 
Amanda and I are very firm believers in if you reach out to us, we're going to respond, if not immediately, as close to immediately as we can. Um, it's the golden rule. You, you treat people the way you want to be treated if you were in their shoes. Um, and one of my pet peeves is calling an office and waiting for a response. Um, we're, we're very accessible. So whether you are in Seattle, Washington or Florida or the New York area, we're accessible regardless. Um, it's, it's. So if someone lives in New York, so if someone lives in New York and is familiar with Stanley law offices, mm -hmm. okay. Or Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. but they have a relative that they think could really use your services. And that relative lives in Arizona. They shouldn't have any qualms about referring the information and saying, look, use Shannon and her team because they're right. on top of it. And it doesn't matter where you're located. Right. And the okay. reason for this and, and what makes social security different from the personal injury and the workers comp side of Stanley law is social security disability is a federal program. It is in all of the United States, which allows us the flexibility to service people wherever they are in the United States. So, yes, right. As of as a, with PI and et cetera, there are different state rules, varies by state correct. limitations, the way the state handles those cases, all that kind of stuff. Now, what would you say to someone who is out of out of New York or Pennsylvania that may need that dual representation in terms of a workers' comp attorney or a PI attorney. Do you work with other attorneys in other states to ensure that there's that cooperation, again, that you spoke of in relation to a workers' comp case, et cetera? If it is a state that, that we're familiar with and, and we can connect them, we absolutely do. Um, okay. Some cases, some states, I, I, I will be very candid, we, we aren't familiar with, um, but we can work with the client to help them identify that is a potential issue for, for another attorney um, to handle. And we can right. do make sure to or make sure if you've got a workers comp attorney, make sure you ask, are you asking this question? Are you having Correct. the case structured so you can help certainly a gu guide Correct. and advise them accordingly? Correct. Okay. Any other points that you want to touch on, Shannon, before we go? How do you, what would you say to someone if they're sitting going, maybe I should, you know, pursue this sooner than later, and maybe I should reach out for help. What, what should someone do next? As we talked about earlier, sooner is always better than later um, because waiting unnecessarily can cost in terms of back due benefits. Um, because Social Security is already a long enough process as it is, waiting also makes what is going to be a long process even longer. Um, yeah, so true. I would encourage if if you think that that Social Security disability um, is unfortunately where your your mental or physical or both health um, is leading you reach out and give us a call. We'll, we'll gladly talk to you, um, see if it's a case that we think um, we can be successful with um, and, and help guide you through the process. Right. Cause it's not always a slam dunk. And I, I do want to put that a little bit of a disclaimer when you call people, you know, sometimes there are cases, Shannon, that are very obvious that maybe they did mostly work under the table most of their life. Mm -hmm. Right. And the work credits aren't there, or there's some kind of caveat in there that makes it a case that isn't pursuable, which is disheartening. Mm -hmm. I kind of, I got to believe that's a tough spot for you mm -hmm. and Amanda to be in sometimes. Do you do the, does Amanda, is she the only one doing intakes or do you both do intakes? The way that intakes work is um, any of the paralegals in the office can do intakes. Um, you know, with social security, Amanda does do a lot of them. Um, they will ask um, some basic questions, you know, name, age, level of education, get an idea of what your work history is. Um, and then they will ask some more specific information um, about your medical issues. You know, what is your particular medical condition? Um, get an idea of 
what kind of treatment you're getting um, because all of those pieces of information help me make my decision. So as the, the paralegal is working on the intake, they will present the information to me. Um, and I almost always have follow-up questions because I want to make sure that we're not missing anything. Um, I don't want to say no to a case. If there is any amount of any doubt, shred of hope, <laughs> correct. You know, I, I want to make sure um, that we're not leaving any T's uncrossed or any I's undotted. I want to make sure that we're getting the full picture to make the best decision that we can for you and, and to help guide you. And, you know, the maximum award. I mean, that's what you're looking for in each correct. and every in each and every situation. And I, I can attest to, again, from these reviews and some of the, the team meetings that we have, and I hear behind this curtain, behind the scenes at Stanley Law, is that if there is any window of opportunity for you to realize any measure of social security disability benefits or social security income benefits, that Shannon and Amanda, Shannon and her team are the ones to get it for you. So with that, um, you can call Stanley Law Offices, 1-800-608-3333. You can email info, I-N-F-O, info at stanleylawoffices.com. Um, and someone will get back to you right away and, um, and do a, a full intake. If you call someone can do an intake with you right away. So thank you, Shannon. Um, we will be doing these often, right, Shannon? You want to do more of these. I think it's super helpful for people. Correct. Hopefully we can get on a, a schedule and, and let people know in advance when they're coming. So if there's a particular topic um, that they want to tune into, they can tune into. Um, we also welcome suggestions of, of topics right. in Social yeah. Security. Yeah that people would like to know more about. Um, feel free to send us in in topics and, and we'll do our best to, to incorporate that into an upcoming webinar. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you all very much. Again, you can visit Stanley Law Offices on YouTube. Follow us on TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, um, Twitter, X. Um, and uh, stanleylawoffices.com is the, and there are a lot of great resources on the website. Certainly, you know, videos like this and our past webinars, top frequently asked questions. You can look under the FAQ section. Um, there might be some insight for you there, uh, as well as just hearing about and reading about Shannon's background. You can find her under the About Us, um, the team at Stanley Law. Check out our other attorneys. And we thank you, Shannon. We'll see you again soon. And everyone out there, be safe, be well, be healthy, and uh, find joy in the day-to-day -day life as you possibly as much as you possibly can. You say hello to your husband and family, Shannon, <laughs> and and your fur babies. And, yes. Um, we'll see you again soon. Have a great day, everybody.